You're dealing, you're dealing in artillery, you're dealing with a, the gunnery problem, and it involves three elements. It involves a forward observer, fire direction center, and the gun crew. And it's, believe it or not, it's simple trigonometry. If the forward observer spots a target, he determines an azimuth using a lens at a compass, he shoots an azimuth to that target. Now that's from him to the target that he wants you to hit. That's called the observer target line. Now then, he sends that information back to the fire direction center, which is located in this, in this, in that ditch back over there. They've got tables, and so they can draw on a map what the observer target line is. They know where they are, so they take their position and draw that line where it meets the observer target line. That's called the gun target line. Now you solve the angle, simple trigonometry. You solve the angle. And then you send information called dope up to the guns. And they, the gunners on their panatomic telescopic sites can dial those numbers in. That makes the gun tube move one way or the other. Now, that's for deflection. Deflection means left or right, elevation means up or down. So what happens is on deflection, you've got barber poles out there. Red and white look like barber poles, and those are called aiming stakes. What happens is, once you set those numbers that were given to you by the fire direction center onto the site, you then crank the weapon around so that the site comes over onto that barber pole. And that barber pole has a direct trigonomic relation to the target area. This is going to get deep. <laughs> now, you know at this point that the base piece of the battery, if he fires, is going to fire in the right direction. What's the next problem? Height range. How far away is it? You can measure that on a map. For a 105 howitzer, each round that you're going to load into the tube has four powder bags. So the maximum range would be charge four. All four powder bags go in after the propellant. There's a little shotgun shell thing. You pull a lanyard, ignites the powder, and forces the round to go down range. You have in the fire direction center, you have a scale that will tell you if you're firing at 17,000 yards, you need charge three. So that information goes out to the gun crew. They take the four powder bags, shit can one, and put the three back in the tube, and it will fire that range. That's called the gunnery problem. And boy, is that more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> how, how, long, how long do they have to figure that out? Oh, it, it happens instantly. These guys are, you, you can do it in seconds, 30 seconds, and you've got the information down to the guns. How far are the, the guns will just run it onto the site and fire. 
How far are those barber poles away from the, the guns themselves? Usually about 25 to 30 meters. So out in front of the gun position, you would have seen these red and white poles. Ah. Those are the aiming stakes. And, and they're surveyed in with it using a, a theodolite. And the dope, would the, is that, I wonder if that's where the expression, like, give me the, give me the dope, give me the straight exactly. dope that's comes exactly from. That's exactly where it came from. Oh. Wow. Either that or, you're a fucking dope. <laughs> <laughs> Another fucking <laughs> <laughs> Why does that always look at you, Ian? I was like, dig it. <laughs> what, what about, you know, adjusting for wind direction, speed, all that sort of the deflection? With the 105, you don't have much problem with that. It's too big a round. If you've got a 175 or an 8 inch that fires a really high trajectory, mm -hmm. And that's the difference between a gun and a howitzer. A real high, high directory, then you've got a wind problem. But that information is also in the fire direction center. So if you've got winds at elevation of 15 to 20 knots, you know that you need to crank in a little more left or a little more right. And did they have the balloons up and uh, kind of the weather uh, stuff up in here? Uh... In theory, you should have. Sometimes they'd, they'd launch these weather balloons that had a... Uh, a wind speed indicator on them, uh, but the Germans weren't up to that at no. that point. So they would look, you know, it, you look at trees mm -hmm. up high, and you see if the leaves are moving, and you can estimate. What so you're playing golf. It's like exactly. Tiger Woods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> same thing as a golf. Yeah, they just right. pull an eight iron. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a seven. Yeah, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, what happened is there was there was a machine gun position out here, an MG34, was security for the battery. And they came in in this direction, and I think they rolled them from gun four to gun one. <clears throat> so they had to cross that ditch, get into the ditch, cross the ditch, and then they enfiladed the fire that went down. They took the 34 out, and then they started firing down the line of howitzers. And as they got fire superiority, Winter started sending guys up forward to get to the guns. And they, they really needed to knock out the guns. You know, killing Germans is fun and shit, but you really need to knock out the gun. And the way they did it, they had um, each of the paratroopers carried a little uh, chunk of uh, Composition B. The problem was, when they got out here, nobody had any fuses or caps uh -huh. to make the shit explode. Uh -huh. So they ended up using grenades, and they dumped grenades down the tubes, and it bulged the, the tubes and split them in a few places, so they couldn't use the howitzers again. So were they German grenades? Uh, in, in the series, they, used, they, they showed... used a mixture of their own okay. and Germans. They okay. just throw anything that would explode. Yeah. They threw down. Yeah, them. yeah. Was that by accident? They didn't have the fuses, or they just carry around this composition B without? It depends without on who you them. talk to. Lipton told <laughs> he me. He talked to Malarkey. That <laughs> Lipton, <laughs> Lip, yeah, Lipton. Yeah. Lipton told me that they thought they had them. <clears throat> But when they got ready to make the move, nobody could find them. They oh, had man. the caps or anything. They had the explosive, but they couldn't uh -huh. make it go. Do you have the lighter? Yeah. yeah. Right. Can you Did help they me here? The element of surprise that the Germans not expect them. I, I think I think where where we were in the, the manor house over there was the, the battery command. That was uh, where the, the, the commanding officer of the battery and a number of you know the guys handling the communications and everything. They we were saw in the his blood stain. Mm -hmm. And the, the actual grunts. You know, the cannon cockers, the gun dummies that were out here ramming and slamming rounds, they were all out in this area. So how, how heavily defended was it on the perimeter? You, nominally, you had eight men per gun. Okay. For, that's, that's a normal gun crew. And you probably had four in the fire direction center, and then you had three or four out in that. So in the end, they probably ended up taking on 30, 35 people. <clears throat> And the machine gun was over in here, correct? Yeah, it's right out. And, right out among and its those field cows. of fire was what direct? What it was? He had a, he had about a 270 degree arc of fire. The only way he wouldn't fire is back, was back towards the guns. Gun. Yeah. So, and you see these cows out here? <laughs> what's what's weird about the cows? Brown eyes. <laughs> <It'll see you. laughs> <laughs> They've got brown eyes. They got brown circles around their eyes. That's the Norman breed of cow. And do not be the idiot who does Band of Brothers and puts dead cows all over the set, and they are not Norman cows. <laughs> if your ass is grass when you get back over here, and the cow farmers get over. I had this this gal who represented There's always, this gal yeah. represented the Norman Cattle Breeders Association or something. Like that. Of dead cows. Of dead and cows. I got on the bus and she assaulted my <laughs> You got the cows wrong! Shit, wait a minute. 
And what's it mean? Dead cows. No, they have to be Norman cows. Anyway, yeah. do not do that. That Norman lobby is tough. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're tough. tough. <laughs> they're tough. Yeah. A, a dead cow lobby. They think the end. Yeah. Yeah. They're called yeah. bean counters, and I get them all the time. Yeah. yeah. I call them stitch Nazis. Stitch Nazis. <laughs> I remember that from your okay. well, museum. Stitch Nazis are the, are the people with the the remote control <laughs> that go through every frame. <laughs> and if I use the wrong thread, yeah. my ass hears about yeah. it. Yeah. Believe yeah. me. You think the cow's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Do not use the wrong color thread on the. Uh, that nylon was These not made people, until You know, they're in their underwear, they're yeah, living in their mom's basement. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do. So in the show, it was an, it was, it was, it was it was a straight, straight line. And that was, you know, coin toss. It was, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was easier to put them in a straight line than to make an L shape. And that can only be known from from who? From the guys who were there. Winters came and said it was an L. Uh, they, yeah, Winters drew they a remember. diagram. Yeah. And the, when we showed it around to other historians, and they said, well, it's not correct. <laughs> not correct. <laughs> <laughs> the guy. Yeah. So maybe, <laughs> we then look. But you know, in in, in our in that episode, in the Break or Man episode, you never back off far enough to see the actual shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you just see three guys. And yeah, see more of those.